live uh, on Earth for a limited time only. That was, that was my third CD. I, I make all these titles, nobody laughs, you know? What the fuck? You know? What about, you ever hear One Track Heart? Nobody laughed. You heard of One Track Mind, right? But when you heard One Track Heart, you went, what? No more titles. Just me and more me. Let's see if we can sing a few minutes. You okay?
They say that uh, the name and what is named, or the name and God, are not different. The names we sing and chant are actually the sound form of that love. So when we chant, we're not trying to make something happen. We're not trying to manipulate our emotions or... And we shouldn't waste our time trying to have any particular kind of experience. We should simply pay attention to the sound of the name. And that's hard enough. Everything else will happen on its own, because our true nature is, is always here. We're always here, we just don't pay attention. Our awareness, our attention is glued to all the stuff around us, including our own thoughts. So the practice is to release that and just come back again and again. And again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And as time goes on, as the practice deepens, as we ripen ourselves by bringing ourselves back from uh, dreamland, One time Ram Dass and I were sitting at the breakfast table, after breakfast, almost until dinner. <clears throat> and we were like we used to do all the time. And sometimes we'd be in silence for long periods, sometimes we'd talk. So this day I happened to hit record on the, my phone. So after many hours of sitting there, I said to him, you know, I recorded this conversation. And what should I call it? <clears throat> and he quieted for a minute. He said, Call it Dick and Jeff's Journey to Soul Land. <laughs> ah. Yeah. So, yeah. Got to do some practice. I mean, you just, you have to. I'm sorry. I really am. It's like we've fallen off a cliff and, you know, there's all kinds of things to hang on to on the way down, but we're not paying attention, so... That's what happens. And, like I said before, Maharaji said to us many times, through the repetition of the name, everything is accomplished. I mean, come on, that's a fucking guarantee. That's, he doesn't lie about that stuff. He lies about other things like, oh, I'm just going for the day, I'll be back. You know, three months later, you don't know where he is. That he lies about, but he doesn't, he doesn't mess around with the real stuff. Through the repetition of the name, everything is accomplished. Now, do I believe that? If I really believed it, if we really believed it, what else would we do? Right? If we really believe that these that there really is something to find, or let's put it this way, to the extent that we do believe that we can find real love, real happiness, and a good way to live in this world right now, regardless of what's going on out there. If we really believe that, our lives would instantly be different. 
Instantly, they would, everything would change. Our whole perspective would change. The way we went through the day would change. The way we saw other people would change. The way we saw ourselves would change. But we don't. We're too busy. Moping around. I, I was born a moper. Moped mope my whole life away, you know. And I, I have to admit, Father, Father, I confess, I mope around less than I used to. And I miss it. I really do. It was home base for so long, you know. It's like, ah, oh, fuck, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, sometimes I do it just for fun. <clears throat> so... All right, let's take some questions, if there are any questions, or whatever you want to talk about. Oh, I'm not going to pick. You have to give whoever five rupees. This guy's poor. Give him five rupees. Pick somebody. Don't stand there. Raise your hands high so he can see you. He's a little uh, acuity challenged. Howdy. Hari Maharaj. Hi, Krishna Das. Hi. This isn't really a question, but uh, I just wanted to tell you, on Thursdays, I had you on my large TV <clears throat> during the pandemic, almost every Thursday. I was so distraught, and I just wanted to tell you how much that meant to me mm -hmm. to sit with you on those afternoons. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I, I was going to just come up and thank you, but I thought I really wanted to thank you here because I know it was out of the generosity of your heart, and I felt like I wasn't alone mm. during that time. <clears throat> so Great. I just wanted to say that. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's always good to hear nice things about oneself. <laughs> thank you. I learned that from Pema Children. You know, I was with her at one program she gave and a woman said something, you know, Pema, you know, so thank you. Oh, it's so nice to hear good things about me. So I, I learned that. Thank you. Well, I love Thursday. The rest of the week, I'm totally asleep, but Thursdays I show up. <laughs> Thursdays good. Uh, yeah. And you know, I, I really, I feel that we really enter in that space together on Thursday. I really do. And God forbid I should ever look at the chat, what's going on in the chat. I don't want to know. But I'm not responsible <laughs> for whatever trouble you people get into when I'm singing. All right, who else? Who are you? Hi. Hi, Krishna Jones. So a few Chai and Chats ago, um, via Zoom, I had asked you about my mother and how to deal with some of the... Um, she's 93, she's had dementia for about four or five years now. Uh -huh. She's now in a wheelchair, she can't feed herself or anything, and, and she often cries out, help, and somebody save me, and, and that sort of thing frequently through the day. And I asked your advice on how I might help bring some ease to her life or try to help her in some way. Um, I, uh, my takeaway from what you told me was that I might be bringing some of my own stuff into the room. And um, after a phone call, I was really irritated for quite a while <laughs> uh, because I, I thought, okay, you know, maybe he didn't hear me when I said I worked in hospice, so I'm used, or I volunteer in hospice, so I'm work, used to working with people that are passing, and, and maybe he just didn't understand this. And I had enough resistance to know that there must have been something there. My mother lives five hours away, and in my next visit with her, um, when she started to have uh, crying out, um, mm -hmm. um, I, I noticed that, that, that there was a lot of stuff I was bringing into that situation, mm -hmm. um, like that, uh, you know, that I should be able to do something to transform her experience. Uh, that, you know, I wanted to be able to prove something to all the staff that I'm the daughter that can come in and bring ease to her. There was all kinds of egoic stuff that I was bringing in there 
um, that I recognized. And cool. Um, so uh, what happened next is I was just sitting with her and imagining that uh, Maharaji had us under a blanket and she fell into a sleep in her chair and and then went into a very deep sleep where um, her inhales became very shallow, her exhales became very long. And at one moment I thought, I think she's going to transition here. And when I had that thought, I started to say, Ram, Ram, Ram. And after a little while, she had this big inhale. And she opened her eyes and she looked at me, or she looked up, and it was the most profound look of joy I had ever seen on my mother's face. Mm. And she kept saying, I almost got a kiss from him. I almost got a kiss from him. Wow. And I just said, oh, you almost got a kiss from him. And then all of a sudden, she just locked into my eyes and looked at me. Mm. And for the first time in a long time, and she saw me. She saw me probably for the first time, maybe in my life. I don't know. And she said, there you are. And say that again? She said, there you are. Uh -huh. And I said, yes, here I am, Mom. And she said, you know, I was just, it was just my role. And I said, yes. And she said, you know I love you. And I said, yes, and I love you. And then she said something that she always said all the time, anytime we were parting. Well, give us a kiss then. Huh. And I kissed her. And then she kind of went on. But I just wanted to say that that moment with my mother would not have happened without your guidance. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful for the way that you are so accessible through Thursday nights and Chai and Chat, and you've certainly changed my life, and I have deep appreciation for you. Thank you. Well, my father had Alzheimer's too. And, um, You know, there's, when they first begin to realize that they, there's something wrong, they have this panic in their eyes. Like we would run a, we were in a cab together and we were making plans to meet later in the week for something. So as he's getting out of the cab, I said, okay, dad, so I'll see you on Thursday, okay? You know, his eyes went white. He couldn't remember anything, right? So that's when, that's, the period when those people with dementia and Alzheimer's suffer. They recognize that something's going on that they can't do anything about. A little later, they're not suffering anymore because they've... The, whatever holds them to the identity that they had is pretty much gone. So they're floating in this space, you know, they don't feel pain the way we do, they don't recognize things. Uh, so every time I was going off on tour, I went to see my father, say goodbye, because I, I didn't know, you know if he'd still be there when I came back, if he'd recognize me. So same thing happened. So one day we're sitting there watching the same reruns of Seinfeld again and again and again, because it was always new to him. Every, every... <laughs> it was a great place to do a lot of mantra. Okay. So, all of a sudden, I must have been in a commercial break. He looks over and he sees me on the couch. And he gets up out of the chair. And he comes over to the couch and he sits down right next to me, you know, like right here. Hi, Dad. You know, and he's looking at me. And he says, what you're doing is so incredible. I'm so proud of you. You're traveling around the world, chanting with people, singing with people. It's amazing. So much. And he went on like that for what seemed like 150 years. It was probably 30 seconds or a minute. And then 
He disappeared again, went back to the chair and back into Seinfeld. And that was the last time I saw him physically. I mean, I saw him again physically, but the last time he was there. One time, I, at some point, he became, it became too difficult for his wife to take care of him because she worked all day. And so he went into a facility, and, which was horrific. But anyhow, my sister went there and she was, took him into the, the room, uh, the common room, and he, she played a, a DVD of me chanting. And in the middle of it, my father looked up at her and said, Tell KD, I'm chanting with him in my mind. Wow. So, you know, yeah. It's interesting, I don't know, you know, it's just, where are they when they're not? Who are they when they're not who they are, who they used to? thought they were all those years, you know. They're still here, they're still present, but they're not available the same way. Yeah, anyway. Hi. Hi. I'd like to ask you about Chanting and kirtan. What are that? <laughs> what would you like to ask me about? Well, I'm not a musician. Neither I'm, am I. I just look like one. Yeah. It's a good show. Yes, very good. Thank you. Um, and my path, my awakening path, didn't really include chanting much. I, I grew up Jewish, and we did do the. Friday night, and we sang and danced, and so there was that. But uh, later on my path of awakening, it was a very pretty mental oral tradition. And coming to Maui, I became, coming to Maui, I became um, more acquainted with kirtan. Now, I don't understand the words. I don't know what the words mean. Neither do I. Still? I hope so. <laughs> If because I could understand them, it wouldn't be what they really are. Uh-huh. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> but, uh, but so, you know, you're not going to know who you are at the end of this conversation. <laughs> who says I know now? <laughs> but really what I've been experimenting with is, you know, my meditation. I come to see that lately at night, uh, I put kirtan on, and that feels like my meditation. R.D. once told me that, she, I, this is something I loved, this brought me to Kirtan when he said, Kirtan is a protection for the mind. Protec and protection, protection for the mind? Protection for the mind. Mm -hmm. And for me, where mind was sort of my, my doorway in, I loved that. And at that moment, I adopted it as something mm -hmm. useful for me. And now it's sort of deepening into where my meditation takes me. Even though I don't know what the words mean, I know the sound of it, and I know where it takes me. Is that the same as meditation? I suppose you think I, I know the answer to that question. <laughs> um, the real meaning of the names is your own true nature, which is beyond your conceptual mind. You got that? So there's nothing else to discuss. Of course it's meditation. Meditation means residing in your true nature, ultimately. Being, recognizing your true nature, who you are. It's being no longer identified with your stuff and recognizing your real, the reality of your own soul, your own being. One of the definitions of meditation is to become familiar with, to be, become familiar with being yourself, being who you are, not who you think you are. So the real meaning of these names is not, even Kabir, the great poet, used to say, my Ram is not that, that prince, you know? My Ram is 
the one beyond the beyond the beyond. Our true, the true being, the true nature of reality, that's Rama. So through the repetition of the name, gradually but inevitably, that place within us is uncovered. It isn't something you can understand with your mind because your mind is just a bunch of thoughts. And thoughts come and thoughts go. They don't stay. And they come and they go and you're still here. So if <clears throat> there are different types of meditation, like conceptual meditation, where you, th where you think about something pleasant or that inspiring and you get a good feeling. But you, that's not the deepest kind of meditation. That's a good, a very good way of developing the ability to pay some attention to what's going on. But ultimately, so people ask me all the time, what do I experience when I'm chanting? And I say, how do I know? What do you, I, I'm just chanting. And if I notice I'm not paying attention, I come back to paying attention. I don't write down what it is I was thinking about and what time it was and how long I thought about it. I just let it go and come back. So the, the experiencer is what gets less needy, less grippy, less sticky. You know, <clears throat> back in the old days in, in, with Maharaji and Kenchi, uh, many of you have heard this story, but so he had these, the Kirtanwalas from Brindavan come and sing Hare Krishna around the clock. So after this whole spring, summer, rainy season, fall, uh, one of these guys tried to seduce one of the Western women who was there with us. So of course Maharaji found out about it. And in about two minutes, all 15 of these guys were loaded on the back of a truck with all their stuff, brought back to the train, brought down to the train, back to Brindavan, where they came from, where they lived. So one of the Indian people said, Baba, you kicked out the Kirtanwalas. Who's going to sing now? The Westerners. Ah, shit. This was not good news, you understand, because the room that we had to sing in was around the corner from the courtyard where he used to sit. So when we were singing, we couldn't see him. And staring at him was my spiritual work at the time. That was my practice. That was the only thing I was doing, you know, that was it. And now he was sending me away to do some silly practice. So, and worse than that, they had this World War I microphone hanging from the ceiling, blasting out our cacophonous music to the whole valley. You could see the women working in the field, you know, going like, And my singing partner was from Greece, and she had a very rich Greek accent. So you can imagine how Hare Krishna sounded, you know. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And so, we only had one instruction. Sing. There was no inkling of how long we were going to be forced to sing, you know. And we, we had like a period, we came to the temple around 10, and we were sent back home on the last bus about five. So there was a seven hour window to see Maharaji and he wouldn't be out all the time. He'd come out for a while, go back in, come out. You had to be right there, you know, waiting. Otherwise, and now we were stuck in this stupid room, you know. And so it was like eternal damnation. You know, sing again and again, the same thing over and over and over and over and over. You don't, your mind is going to say, are you kidding me? I ain't paying attention to this stuff. And you just start to live your, you know, you rewind your life. Wow, when I was three, I remember that. That was so cool. Yeah, you know. And you're singing at the same time. You know, you're chanting. And you're going like, uh, you, so I just like relive my own life, you know. I remember my old girlfriend back in the middle, Hare Krishna. 
You know, and then I remember she broke up with me. Hare Krishna, you know. So you, you can't stop singing, but you know, you also, you know, you don't, you, you know. But after, you know, days and days and days and into weeks of this, you know, you realize there is absolutely no escape. And still, you have to keep singing. Eventually, your mind just says, all right, fuck it, I'll, I'll stay here. And then something else happens. The mantra... So... I won't tell you this if, unless you promise me you'll never think about it again. <laughs> promise? I didn't hear everybody. <laughs> All right, okay. And it's for your own sake, I'm telling you not to think about this. Of course, you're going to now, more than ever. So, the mantra became like home. It was a very strange thing. You know, like those, with the, who is that artist with the figure ground reversal stuff? Huh? Yeah, Escher stuff. You know, you look at it and you think you're seeing something and all of a sudden, whoosh, the black comes up in the front and the white goes to the back and the back, you know, like this. So that's what happened. The mantra became home base. And the thoughts would like, like, fly by, you know. And you just go, and they didn't stick to me. There was, I was sitting in this wide open space, this beautiful, sweet, deep presence. And they didn't, they didn't grab me. It was, and I wasn't making an effort not to be grabbed. The effort I had been making was to pay attention to the sound of the name. So you can't ask the thoughts to kill the thoughts. The ego to kill the ego, the mind to kill the mind. Ramana Maharshi says, that's like asking the thief to be the policeman. There'll be a lot of investigation, but no arrest will ever be made. <laughs> so it's not like, it doesn't work like that. You just come back to the sound of the name. And from, and, and what actually happens is that your, the, uh, the kleshas, the, the obstructions, the karmic afflictions that dictate everything we see, that make up our subjective reality, that make up our world, you know, who you think you are and what you think you're seeing, is completely programmed by your karmic stuff. So, through this practice, that, those, that karma is, is dissolve little by little. It's like the first, the first verse of the Hanuman Chalisa. Same thing. I take the lotus, like the, the, the pollen-like dust, the pollen from the lotus feet of the guru. Now the, the, the lotus grows from the mud, but it sits above the mud on the water and is untouched by the mud. It's completely pure. And there's another great saint, uh, Nisargadatta Maharaj said, the pollen from the dust, the dust from the feet of the guru is pure being, pure consciousness, pure awareness, reality. So you take that dust, and with that dust, you clean the mirror of your heart. And what's the dust on the mirror of our hearts? Greed, selfishness, Shame, fear, anger, manipulating other people for our own sake. All this stuff that we love so much that we just won't ever let go of if we're not made to let go. That's the dust. So by bowing to that pure awareness, that pure being, that real love, that begins to clean off this mirror. And when the mirror is clean, when you look in a mirror and it's covered with dust, what do you see? You see the dust, and you also see a faint, you know, version of yourself, which is not really the way you look, because it's like dull and, you know. But as you clean the mirror off, oh, it comes into view. It, it clarifies, and you see reality. So that's the deal. 
And that's what the names mean. The names are the names of real love, of our true nature. And when we invoke these names, every repetition, for instance, Sri Ramakrishna, who was a great saint that lived in India in the 1800s, he, uh, he, discovered, he, he described how the how practice of the repetition of the name works. It's very cool. He said that every repetition of the name is a seed that gets planted in our being, in our consciousness. And they said the wind picks up these seeds and carries them out. And some of the seeds get caught on the roof of an old house in the between the tiles, right? And in those days, the tiles were made of clay and they weren't necessarily baked in a kiln, but in the sun. So over time and seasons and wind and rain, etc., the tiles begin to break down and get softer. At that point, those seeds that we have planted with the repetition of the name, those seeds begin to grow. And the roots grow. And the roots slowly grow and they destroy, they break up the, 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 the tiles and they keep growing and they destroy the, ha the roof of the house and they keep growing, and they finally destroy the whole house. He says, that house is who we think we are. Our conventional sense of me. The house was created for certain reasons. There was a cause to create that house. That's karma. That's what created this body. That's what created this sense of who we think we are. So through the repetition of the name, that temporary structure of me, ego, is a temporary. Ego is not forever. It's temporary. It may last a whole lifetime, but that's also temporary. The body is temporary. The, ego's, the ego is part of the body in a sense. It comes with the body. So the repetition of the name slowly crumbles that house of me. And then the walls, which are temporary, are gone. And so the space inside, which was me, is freed from that and becomes universal. It becomes the whole. There's no inside and outside anymore. There's no me and you. There's only I. There's only presence, being, everywhere. And it doesn't hurt. It actually feels very good if there was anybody to feel it. <laughs> it's, it's the end of suffering. And this is what Buddha said as he pa passed into enlightenment. He said, oh, house builder, no more houses will you build for this one. No more temporary structures. No more me. Just like Maharaji said, all one, all of this. Inside every little bubble in this room, there's only one of us. But it's, it's constrained by the, by the bubble. And the bubble is who we think we are, who you think you are. And when you're not thinking you are who you think you are, you're just here. And so this is something that you will all, we will all experience sooner or later because it's reality. Remember those commercials for Quaker Oats when you were a kid, shot out of a cannon, you know? You shot out of a cannon, sooner or later you're going to land somewhere. And that's when, when the, the, the ball game's over and, and uh, we find ourselves, our true self. That's the meaning of the names. You don't have to think about it. You cannot possibly understand it because it's the understander that's being dissolved. You can't know whether you're close to it or far away or how long it's going to take because the evaluator is being dissolved.
So, like Mayor Baba said, don't worry, be happy. I hated that, because I was moping around, right? No, don't tell me I can't mope around. So, really, when you sing, have a good time, if you like, if you don't, enjoy that. But pay attention, it doesn't matter what you experience. Guaranteed, it ain't gonna last. What's gonna last is the one who's aware of whatever's happening. So if you keep clinging to what is happening, you never notice who's clinging or what's clinging, right? Put this in a program, right? <laughs> okay, so that's the deal. And Mahar, like I said, Maharaji, you know, so one time, I had to remind Ram Das of this, he completely forgot this. But Siddhi Ma herself told me, one time, you gotta remember, Ram, Maharaji was dedicated to driving Ram Das out of his mind. Totally flipping him out, making him as angry as any human being could possibly be, and then giggling at him. That's what he loved to do, you know? So, but one time, Ram Das was really very upset. And he comes up to Maharaji and he says, Maharaji, I want you to raise my kundalini. Now, this is basically saying, Maharaji, do it, you know, push the button, get me out of here. I'm finished. I can't stand this shit. I want to go. And Maharaji goes, oh, you know, I don't know anything about that. Um, what's that Baba's name down? Oh, he knows that stuff. You go see him. He'll raise your kundalini. Ramdas get angrier. You know, no, Maharaji, you raised my Kundalini. Oh, that other Baba, you know, that guy over there? Oh, he'll, he knows that. You go see him, he'll raise your Kundalini. Ramdas was livid. So Maharaji gets up, throws his blanket over his shoulder, looks down at Ramdas, and he says, I only know two things Ra and Ma. The two syllables of the name of Ram. That's all he knows. Everything else that happens, happens through him. Through him. He is not the doer. He only is immersed in the name of Ram. That's all he knows. That's all he wants. Then. That's all. He's completely merged with the whole universe. There's nobody doing anything. He has no uh, agenda of his own, not even to help us anymore. There's no, it's just all happening because there's no separation, there's no separate self. There's no delusion of a separate self there any longer. There's just the whole universe. So when you sing, Sing. You know, we spent the winter up at Lama in a winter of 69, 70, Ramdas and 10 or 15 other people. And while we were up there, we heard about this New York artist who lived just down the mountain from there, who had been to India and learned how to meditate. Oh, let's go meet this guy. Somebody knows how to meditate. That's. Uh, so we went down to see him, a few of us. We spent the afternoon with him. And uh, I was sitting in the, kind of in the back of the room. People were asking him questions. I was just sitting in the back acting like an asshole, like I usually did. And so it became time to go. And we go out the door. I'm the last one out the door. He stopped me. He grabbed my arm. And I turned around to him and he said, you, you have to find out why it is you can't give yourself a hundred percent to whatever you're doing. <laughs> you know those squirrels on the wall of a taxidermist shop, you know? <laughs> that was me. He nailed me to the wall. How did he know? That was my, that was my biggest suffering that no matter what it is I was doing, I couldn't stop my head, you know? 
It w- I couldn't. I couldn't get out of my head. I was. I couldn't give myself to anything fully. It was really painful, painful time. And of course, it was the beginning of when I started to do practice. So really, I was just beginning to notice how my life has had always been. It wasn't something new. But see, when you add a practice to your life, that's when you begin to notice how stupid we are. You know, come on, how much we're not here, how how much of the time we're totally gone, because you've added something to come back to. And then you realize you're not coming back except for a minute and a half a day when you fall down and trip yourself, you know. That's when you begin to notice how much you're gone. What a blessing. It's very painful, but it's a great blessing. If you don't see it, if we don't see it, we can't do anything about it. It would be just like everybody else. We get born, graduate high school, drink some beer and die. And then that's it. And we're not here for a moment. Right? Whoa. So how do we get here? Practice. Waking up. Whatever practice means to you. You don't need to to do what everybody else does. Find out what brings you home for a minute. And don't try too hard because you'll only get frustrated. And the biggest problem with, with... starting to do, well, doing practice is our expectations. We think, okay, here we go, you know. Nothing's happening, you know. Expectations. We think we're going to sit down in two minutes. Yeah, terrific. I remember (laughs) when I was young, when I was, you know, like 18, I started doing Hatha Yoga. Because I had some crazy idea that I would need to be able to sit for long periods of time, right? Of course, I thought it would be because I'd be in samadhi, not just watching TV. <laughs> so I, I, I stretched my legs out and I was able to, you know, still I can sit for long periods of time. I should have put the order in to also be able to walk. <laughs> That's what I forgot. So I can sit, but sooner or later you're going to have to carry me around, you know. We need to do some practice, but don't do too much. A couple, a few minutes a day, maybe a few times during the day, three minutes, turn the timer on on your phone, the timer app, turn the, turn the, the, put it on silent so the calls don't come through and just sit there for three minutes. It's going to seem like a really long time. And then boom, and then, okay, then go live your life again. Start trying to develop a way to come home once or twice a day, just to, just to come back, you know. Whatever it is that does it for you, do it. Because if you don't do it, you don't do it. Nothing happens. It's up to us. And if we're even thinking about this at all, we already have grace we already have blessings, if we're already involved in this at all. So, <laughs> you know, Maharaj used to say, uh, he used to tease us, he used to torture us, actually. He used to tease us. He said, I have the keys to the mind. And I could turn your minds against me. But I don't do that, you know, and he'd laugh, you know. He's, and you think about, you know, he turn your mind, you wake up one morning in Nanital and you say, what am I doing in India? And you pack your bags and you go to Delhi. You forget he even exists. He would transfer you. There's a transfer, Hojaiga. I'll transfer you. Don't do that. And he laughed. It was like his way of just playing. But he did say he has the keys to the mind. Whoa. So many years later, I, I, I was sitting with Siddhi Ma. And I said, Ma, Maharaji said he has the keys to the mind. So... To me, that means that I am where he wants me to be, where he's put me, right? That's what that means to me. So Ma, is, it, is my effort required or is it all essentially grace, his doing? You know, is, this is the big, the big question. Is it grace or personal effort? You know, everybody gets into this at some point. 
So she said something that was so cool. She said, Krishna Das, it's all grace, but you have to act like it isn't. Oh, that's so good. We don't know what is going on. We don't know who we are. We don't know what we're going. We don't know where we're going. So we have to make an effort. On the other level, there's two levels. There's relative reality, this is our daily reality, and there's ultimate reality, which is the ultimate truth. Where there's no time, for instance. There's no past, no future. But we don't know that. That's not our experience. So even though that's true, true, relatively true is where we live. For instance, if you don't stop at the red light, you'll get hit by a car. That's relative reality. In ultimate reality, there's no light, there's no car, there's no you. <laughs> so, but we live in relative reality, so there are rules and regulations that have to be honored, otherwise we, we suffer terribly. That's what practice is, the ego, using your personal will to motivate yourself to do some practice. Ultimately, Once you get that thing moving, it kind of works by itself. And then eventually, your definition of yourself changes. The way, you see we are, the way we see ourselves changes. And it's all through doing practice. You don't have to think about this. You don't have to read philosophical texts. You just have to pay a little bit of attention to yourself every day. A little bit. It's hard to remember, even to remember, you know, and that's our karmic predicament. But we also are in this room, we're also interested in this stuff, we're also looking for something. And that's also our karmic predicament. So we have the good karmas, the positive karmas, to, to try to liberate ourselves, and we, then we have the dust on the mirror of our hearts. So, we have to work on that. There's no shortcuts. Instant enlightenment, instant liberation takes billions of lifetimes to happen. So, we have to honor where we're really at, not where we like to think we, we are. Anybody? Hi, Katie. Where are you? Right here. Yeah, right. See me? Where's that? Right here. Oh, hi. Hi. Um, so thank you so much for the beautiful chanting. Um, it's been incredible. And um, I've just loved all the teachings of the week so far. And something that Trudy shared yesterday really resonated with me, just how quickly karma changes. and. And then I had a conversation with friends right before this session. And, you know, it was reflected to me, like, in the last few years, I think part of what I experienced was really feeling like I was in a, re a certain reality. And I was so sure of this reality. And then I felt like the rug got pulled out from under me. And so I've been like in this immersive, beautiful healing experience for the last few years, and it's brought me to Ram Dass and given me all of these gifts. And I think where I find myself being stuck is like this kind of lack of trust, a basic mistrust in myself because I felt so disoriented by that experience. And I just feel curious how you rebuild that trust in, in self um, as you keep walking this path. <clears throat> well, we have to be a little bit... Uh, that experience you had was with a, uh, a chemical that you ingested. That's what you told me the other day. Right? No. no. Oh, it's a different experience.
You know, I really, I, I don't know what to say. You, uh, the whole spiritual path is learning to trust yourself. There's nothing else you have to do. If you don't trust yourself and your own feelings, where are you going to feel love? It has to be in here somewhere, right? Somebody once told me uh, the lesson of betrayal is trust. You know, I got really angry <laughs> for a long time at that person. And then one day I realized, whoa, you know, I understood it. When we are betrayed by something outside of us, we have to learn to trust ourselves. Because if we see, at that point we can see why we were looking outside of ourselves for something. For love, for instance. And uh, So, the lesson of, of betrayal, or of not getting what you want, is learning to trust yourself because that's where it all is. It's a painful lesson, very painful. We keep looking outside. I, I was once with my Indian father, Mr. Tuari, Casey Tuari. I called him Baba. And uh, he was one of Maharaji's great devotees. In fact, we're putting together a, a little video about him soon. It'll be out sometime this life. And uh, I was telling about this woman I was in love with, you know, and all, oh, and he was listening. Oh, there you go, yeah, yeah. So when I finished, he said, "My boy," he said, "He said relationships out of business. You know, do your business, enjoy." See, he didn't say don't do your business. He said do your business, enjoy. He said, but love, he said. Love lasts 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. Love doesn't come and go. You don't get it from somebody. You don't fall in it and you don't fall out of it. Real love is who we are. So that's a powerful lesson because we, when we are programmed to look outside of ourselves for just about everything. And our parents did, their parents did, their parents did, their parents did. Their parents did. You're, the, the kids you grew up with, their parents did, everybody does in this world. So how to turn that around is really big, big thing. So I really can't speak to your, your particular uh, emotional mishigas, as they say in Sanskrit. But uh, there are reasons you don't trust yourself. Because nothing, ha is, nothing appears without a cause. So remove the, the reasons or unravel the reasons, untie those knots and they can't cause anything at that point. You can't will yourself to feel something that you're not going to let yourself feel no matter how hard you try. You have to find why you feel that way. And Spiritual practice gives us an inner strength that it develops an inner strength and an ability to be able to let go of the stuff that's pushing us around. That stuff is just going to be there all the time, but whether it pushes us around or not is, at some point, is our choice. But that's not a choice you can make like this. It's a, it's a, a strength that comes from learning to trust yourself. And when you trust yourself, uh, you're not so afraid of other people. You're, you kind of trust other people too because you don't, you're not demanding that those, another person give you something that they can't give. And what, what Mr. Tuari was telling me was that, you know, you won't get love 
from another person. You get affection, you can get all kinds of things. But love is, is your, already who you are. And it's who the other person is also. Sometimes if you're with somebody who is at a particular place on the path, then you can, that, that, that experience can be shared. It, two open windows, the light goes through. But for the most part, our windows aren't really open yet. They're working on it. That's why when you chant and you notice you're not paying attention, you come back. See, it comes down to that. You can always let go, no matter what it is. This is, you know, Ram Dass used to say to me over and over again, the stroke saved me. The stroke saved me. He had issues that he wasn't dealing with, that he couldn't deal with, that were really causing him suffering. And once that stroke hit, he had no option except to deal with them. He had to overcome pride, and he had to become tr truly humble. He had to learn how to accept help from other people. This is an alpha male, you know, somebody who, you know, rode motorcycles and flew planes and took a lot of acid. And he had to learn how to be humble. And he found real humility. And he found real openness. He didn't, he wasn't given a lot of choice. Of course, and, and you can see how the same thing can happen to two people and they, they, they have a completely different experience, right? And he, because, so when he first had the stroke, you might remember, he used to say, Maharaji stroked him. He used to say that. And he seemed to believe that Maharaji gave him the stroke as a part of his work on himself. When he went to India, the only time after the stroke, Siddhima had heard that, he said that, and she said, Kramdas, that's not the case at all. Maharaji would never give you a stroke. It was your karma that created the stroke. What Maharaji gives you is the grace and the strength to overcome that karma. And that's what he did, he really did. Uh, thank you, Krishna Das. Raise your hand. Right over here. Oh, Jesus. Okay. <laughs> Way in the back. <laughs> Way in the back. How are you doing? <laughs> doing well. Thank you. Um, my question is about body movements that come out during kirtan. Um, Use oh, the bathroom, please. <laughs> <laughs> Not bowel movements. <laughs> oh, I see. Uh, some, other, some other motions. Uh, over the past few years of... Um, just listening to anything mindfully, but especially kirtan and chants. I've seen footwork come out and certain dancing and even mudras have kind of appeared when I'm kind of lost in it and I, I don't know where they come from. Uh, can you speak to body movements, they, not bowel movements they that come, come out? They come from the same place that they go to, you know. Don't worry about it, just sing. Come back to the name. Whatever's happening, doesn't matter unless you're trying to drive the car and you're asleep, that would be a problem. So whatever, whatever you're experiencing, notice it, but don't forget the name. Don't forget the sound of the name. And it, just allow whatever to happen, happens. Let the thoughts come, let them go. But come back to the sound of the name. Some people sit, some people move, some people... Whatever, it doesn't matter. It's not the issue. It's how you live in the moment, which is hearing the sound of the name. That's what's important. Whether you move, you don't move, doesn't matter. 
It'll change too. Some days you move, some days you won't move. So, it just doesn't matter. I mean, there's nothing to say about it. It's fine. Uh, it doesn't mean you're... Uh, it, it's not especially spiritual. It's not not spiritual. It's just something that happens. It's energy running around. So, don't spend too much time patting yourself on the back about it. You'll hurt yourself. Hi, Katie. Hi. Um, I just wanted to pre uh, express my appreciation for Thursday nights as well. Um, I, I remembered something that Ramdas said once, and um, he, he said, uh, Kirtan is for those who can't meditate. And I think he... <laughs> I think that was a, a dig at you. I mean, he, he, was, he was laughing about it. Um, but that's, that was just something aside. What I wanted to share with you, if you don't mind, is a, a story about Ram Das. Sure. Um, so I was, I was very fortunate to come on uh, two personal retreats with, with Ram Das. And... Um, <clears throat> On the first one was about 18 months before he left his body. And, and it was on about the third day I was uh, sitting in his study talking with him at the bottom of the bed, picture of Maharaji and the beautiful view and you know all the stuff that goes with that. And I, I suddenly had this um, question that I needed to ask him and so I asked the question, and he was on his recliner, and you know how he closes his eyes? And so he closed his eyes, and, and there was nothing. And then I realized he was asleep. <laughs> Great question. Um, and so I just sat there, and it was a few minutes, and um, then he came around. And he sort of sat up a little bit and he looked over at me and he looked directly at me and he, he started to form his lips into, he was going to say something. Like, and then he closed his eyes and went back again. And this time, it was just like nothing. And I sat and I looked and I looked and I looked and I thought, She's, oh my God, you know, I mean... Is he dead? Is he dead? Exactly. I mean, my question was so dumb. I've killed Ramdas. I mean, that's what was going through my mind. I thought it was you. Take him out of here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, and I, then I just, I stayed with him. And um, the point about the story was in the next day, I was, I was walking with, with um, Dasima. And she said, oh, I, I, I heard you had a sleeper. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I said, yes, but you know, the, the thing about it was, it was such a good lesson for me. Because when he went to sleep, I was the only ego that was left in that room. <laughs> and instead of trying, I do a lot of trying, to come up with a question or a conversation or something like that, I was just there with him, and we were just two beings just sitting there. While he was sleeping, I was sitting there, but I was just with him. And so, it was actually really amazing, and I could just sit and appreciate the whole thing. So, I thought you might appreciate that, and I just wanted to share that. Something I keep being curious about. Put the mic to yourself. Something I keep being curious about. Uh, 
Maharishi said, uh, when you Ma go back... Maharaji. Ma <laughs> Maharishi is somebody else. Yeah, okay. He said, when you go back, don't talk about me. Yeah. And I wonder if, if what he means is that he's the conduit for something that you should talk about. Not him personally, but whatever it is, mm -hmm. he's the conduit for I just wonder what you think about that. <clears throat> well, you know, Maharaji didn't allow people to write about him or to talk about him, uh, collect stories. Whenever he heard somebody, one time an Indian guy had collected a lot of stories, he made the guy burn them right before him so he could see they were all burnt, you know. This is when he used to write things down so it wasn't saved online, you know. He didn't, he didn't want any publicity at all. He didn't, didn't need it. It interfered with his, with his ability to be in three or four or ten places at the same time, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, when we, me, Danny, and Ramesh Radas, we wrote letters to KK, as Ramdas uh, told us to do when we wanted to go to India to meet Maharaji. Ramdas said, well, you know, I can't tell you where he is. I'm not supposed to be talking about him, but I certainly can't tell you how to find him. So I said, don't worry about it. I'm going to find him anyway. Don't worry about it. He said, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, you write to KK and see what happens. So I wrote to KK. I got a letter back saying um, Maharaji was no longer in the hills at his temple at Kenji. Oh, got a name. But when he returns, I will show him your letter and then I'll write back to you. Great. So me and Ramesh were out on the West Coast cruising around. Got a letter back from KK. And it went like this. Uh, it said, uh, Maharaji returned to Kenshi, and after a few days I was able to go see him. And I brought your letters to him. Um, as you know, great saints like Maharaji do not encourage the devotees to come to them. But their doors are always open. So if you're here in India, you can come and see him. Fantastic. Let's go. We went. Not exactly. Many years later, KK said to me, after we'd become very close, he said, did I ever tell you what really happened that day? No. He said, I came into the room. There were other people there. He was talking to some other people. And I put your letters down next to him on the tucket, on his bed. And then I sat down and I began to peel an apple and cut it into small pieces to feed Maharaji. So he's talking to these other people. I'm feeding him the apple. He notices the letters and he says, what's that? And I say, they're letters from students of Ramdas. They want to come see you. Nay, tell them not to come. What do I have to do with this? And he went back to his conversation. Now, you see, this is the Leela, the, the drama. You see, the way Maharaji wrote the story is that it all worked out perfectly, you see, because it was KK that Mahara, Ramdas was sent home with KK after his first darshan. And KK was told to serve him and take care of him and do, give him whatever he needed. So KK felt it was his duty in life to help Ramdas. And by helping us, he was helping Ramdas. And now Maharaji was interfering with the very service that he gave KK to do. And this was totally unacceptable. So KK said he began to pout and he stopped feeding Maharaji the apple and he just, he could really pout. I don't know if you've ever seen KK pout. It's extraordinary. You never seen it. Pout. Wow. And Maharaji looked over and he said, Kailash, what's the matter? And he, he would, KK showed, he would push his head back like this, but KK would look away. He wouldn't look at Maharaji. He'd take his hand away. So after three or four of those, Maharaji throws his hands up in the air and says, okay, tell him what you want. So what did KK write? As a good devotee, he's not going to lie, right? He wouldn't lie. He, he never told a lie. But he wrote, as you know, great saints like Maharaji do not encourage the devotees to come to him. But his doors are always open. So if you're here in India, you can come have his darshan. 
You see? Perfect. My whole life dangling by a tiny little thread, you know. It's like, boom. Okay, next life we'll do it again. Okay. Just, and there it is. And here we are, right? Unbelievable. So, Maharaji did not need you to be there to be connected to you or for you to be connected to him. He said, when you think of me, I'm there. You see, it's our own stupidity and karmic afflictions that prevent us from really believing the things that we hear. He doesn't lie. He said, when you think of me, I'm in here, I'm there. Are we thinking of him? He's here. Do we experience that? Yeah. So that's the work we have to do. Is It's the dust on the mirror of our hearts that prevent us from really grokking what's true. He's always telling the truth. But we are not capable at this point of actually believing it. We'd like to be, but we're not. So we better do some way to clean up our room. My mother was right. Jeffrey, clean up your room. Well, we got to clean up our rooms. We do. Otherwise, where's he going to come? We have to clean our hearts. He has no place to sit. But he's here. He said he's here. He's here. So he didn't, he didn't need to, us to come. He didn't need the devotees to come to him. For whatever reason, he allowed certain people to come for certain times. At other times, you know. You know, there's this, so many stories. Like there's a story that young man who came from far away, he took, he took the bus, he took the train, he walked from the local village to Kenshi, and because his grandfather was so sick, his grandfather was an old devotee. And he comes to Maharaji, Maharaji, my grandfather is so sick, he's, he's so ill, he's so ill, he's suffering so much. Maharaji said, take this banana and feed it to him. Everything will be okay. So the guy, boy, carries the banana all the way back on the bus, on the train. He, he mashes up some banana, puts some in his grandfather's mouth. Boop, he dies. Tikho Jaga, everything was there. That's, Tuar used to yell at Maharaji, you say Tikho Jaga, you say it'll be all right when someone lives, you say it'll someone be all right if somebody dies. What's the deal? And Maharaji just laughed, you know. So the man was suffering, he couldn't let go. He couldn't let go, whatever it was, he couldn't, it was his time, but he, he was just suffering so much. Everything will be okay, give him this banana, boop, he's gone. One time he was on the roof with Tiwari again, of one of the temples, and Maharaji started like dancing in ecstasy, saying, oh, she's gone. And he said this, one of this beautiful old ma that used to feed him and take care of him, had died in some distant town. Oh, she's gone, she's gone, now she's gone. Tawari says, you're a butcher. She died and you're dancing in ecstasy. How could you do that? Maharaji looked at him and said, what? You want me to act like one of the puppets, like you? You know, who he is is just beyond what we can imagine. It's so extraordinary and so beautiful. And He's living in the place of real love. He's living where we want to be living. And he's drawing us in to that place which is in our own hearts so that we can be free. And what practice is Practicing letting go of the stuff that keeps us out of our hearts, that fights against that, that being drawn within. We just learn to let go. We learn to let go of our negative thoughts, our negative emotions, our limiting versions of ourselves, our angers, our jealousy, all our stuff. When we let go of all of our stuff, We've let go of all of our stuff, and we, we, 
well, then we can taste the truth, the beauty and the love that we are. Can't get it from somebody else. You can get a little shot, you know, just to keep you moving in the right direction. But it's something we ourselves have to... We have to develop the letting go muscle. Anybody? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, so, due to a series of unfolding circumstances, I've begun flirting with the possibility that the man photographed behind you might be my guru, uh, which has been a really bizarre process and I guess I've been experimenting with different ways to relate um, to that form and to the thing that's behind that form within myself and I wanted to ask you if to speak about beyond Kirtan uh, how you relate to Maharaji in your day-to-day -day life um, about how you might converse with Maharaji or, or other things like of that nature. Nah. <laughs> you don't want my program. You have to make your program. You have to, you will develop a relationship with him in the way that's right for you. And uh, you can't be me and I can't be you. So he's, he's available to you just like he's available to me. The question is whether it makes sense to you in your life, you know, I mean, <clears throat> Once again, do you know one of the things he said? He said, I'm the guru of the whole world. What? You know? So, live your life, become the best human being you can be, find a way to open your heart and be honest with yourself about your bullshit and you will be with him in your way. Find out what you need to do for you to, to develop your relationship with him or not. It's up to you. We think. So... I mean, I could tell you the way I experienced him, but what is it, how does that help you? Then that's in your head, and you think if you don't experience that, maybe you're doing something wrong. Or you want to experience that, and you'll, you'll, you won't notice the things you are experiencing. That wouldn't be useful at all. So it's, it's your life. Do it. You know, and find out why you can't do it 100% why you can't really give yourself to the things you want, you know. You know, and I, I talk from my own experience. For instance, we met Maharaji through Ramdas, and we met Maharaji through Ramdas's understanding of Maharaji. He would talk about him, and he transmitting his relationship with Maharaji. And we were whoosh, drawn in, you know, we had powerful, you know, for, for me, it was really the beginning of the rest of my life when I met Ram Dass. So there I am in India. Ram Dass has come back now for his second visit. And we're together traveling around with Maharaji here, there, all kinds of things. 
So one of the things Ramdas felt was that he didn't want to crowd Maharaji. This is, you know, so he used to sit on the other side of the courtyard. Maharaji would be out on his bed meeting people over there, all the Indian people, and all the Westerners would sit with Ramdas on the other side of the courtyard. And this went on for the whole year that he was there. Then he, he went back to America, for, and I was still in India. So one day, I was in the temple. I think I was by myself. I don't think there were any other Westerners there at that moment. And I was sitting on the other side of the courtyard, and Maharaji was out on the other side, on the tucket. Indian people coming, bowing, laughing, joking, having a great time. And I'm sitting on the other side of the courtyard, and I went, why am I sitting here? He's over there. So I got up and kind of, you know, walked across the courtyard and I sat down. He didn't say anything. He didn't boot me back on the other side. That was the beginning for me of a whole other way of relating to him. I developed my own quality, the, all the things I needed for me in that relationship started to come out in a different way. Not that I had to reject anything from before, but there was a more personal... Ramdas kept a distance. And Maharaji respect, not only respected that, but honored that. One time he sent Tuari over to touch Maharaji's feet, uh, touch Ramdas's feet. And Ramdas said, why did you do that? He said, Maharaji sent me over here to touch your feet, and he said to tell you that, uh, that you understand him perfectly. Right? But if I tried to sit there, nobody was going to come touch my feet. But if I went over and followed my own heart, it was, that was what I had to do. That was a big thing. And that's what we all have to do. He's inside of you. So trying to see him the way I see him, even if it turns out to be the same way of seeing him, eventually that's something you have to figure out. You have to develop that. And you will, if you want to. So that's the deal. I used to like to try to talk Hindi to Maharaja, you know? So one day I walked to the temple from Nainital. It's about a four-hour walk over the mountains, you know. And I was practicing this line. I was going to say to him, you know, when I saw him at the temple after this, I was going to say, Maharaji, my life is in your hands. And I said it like a thousand times or more on the way, you know. <clears throat> I get to the temple. I walk in. And he's sitting out all alone by himself. This is really rare. Nobody's around. So I walked over and I touched his feet. I stood up and I said, Maharaji, your life is in my hands. <laughs> what? Get, get out of here. <laughs> One of my guru guys, you know, he was very smart, very clever. He saw the way the Indians used to cut up this, these soft apples and feed to Maharaji. <clears throat> so one day he came into the room, there were other Indians around, and he came into the room and he had cut up an apple and he offered it to Maharaji like this. He said, Maharaji had a look on his face as if your dog sat up and started talking to you. <laughs> like, he's like, what is he doing, this guy, you know? <laughs> Hare Rama. Another thing he said, once I take a hold of your hand, I never let go. Even when, not if, you let go of mine. So, you know, that's why I started chanting again. I didn't 
sing for 21 years after he died, really as practice. I, we sang a little bit, but for me it wasn't real. There was no real volition behind it in terms of trying to connect. For me it was like rubbing salt in a wound because I was so emotionally uh, destroyed and by my attachment to his body. So then in 95, <clears throat> In 94, I had this epiphany in my room where I saw if I didn't start chanting with people, with people, I would never be able to clean out the dark corners in my own heart. And I understood this was the only way that I could do that. This is what was being given to me. And if I didn't do it, I didn't do it. So eventually I got with the program. But what I was doing was I was trying to connect with him again from my side. He had never left me, but I had left him. I mean, for all intents and purposes, my reality, right, was that I had, I had lost, lost it. And uh, it became, I, I understood that if I wanted to find him again, find his hand again, I had to start singing with people. So, thank you. <laughs> really, if you didn't come, I'd just be home watching TV. <laughs> and I wouldn't be able to do what I have to do to find him. So really, it's good. this is good for both of us. Anybody? I have a, a quick question. Here. Quickly, where are you? Jump Here. up and down. Oh, okay, don't jump, it's okay. So, when you talk about your love for Maharaji, I experience that love through Ram Das, through hearing him. One day it just struck me and it was something that like opened my heart in a way that you know. So, for me the transition to Maharaji has been, and I felt that love, <clears throat> that huge love, also through singing your songs, your, your kirtan and saying the name, and that has kind of been parallel to this immense love that I had for Ramdas. It has been difficult for me to transition to Maharaji. Um, and I feel like it's more kind of God, him being a saint, and a bodhisattva with all the love of God. And, but when I think and I try to connect with that God, what comes up is Ram Das. And, you're, and it's like, I, I talked about this in one of the, like in something in with, not with you, but there were some of other devotees of Maharaji. And they felt like I was kind of insulting no, not insulting, but like I was disrespect, like Maharaji, right? Like it's not Ramdas, it's Maharaji. And like first, I got all the, confused and... The first rule of devotion is shoot all devotees. <laughs> and don't listen to anything they say. Um, what's the problem? There's no problem. No. You just think there is, that's all. Love is love. Next. Doesn't matter. You're making trouble for yourself for no reason. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I have to study. Wait, let me, I have to read my books first so I can give you an answer. I have to give mantra and mindfulness practice. You can be mindful when you're saying mantra, can't you? Then? Yeah, there's no... Mindfulness means paying attention. And you really should be paying attention when you're chanting. Don't get lost in trying to make something happen, because then you won't be paying attention. That's why I said just come back to the name, the sound of the name. Be with the sound, be aware of the sound of the name. That's awareness, mindfulness of the sound. Now, Buddhist mindfulness practice has different, uh, many different levels of practice, many different techniques of being mindful of different things. Here we're just picking the name to be mindful of. 
Mindful means not, being, not getting lost. So, because getting lost, Groucho Marx once said that he would never want to join any club that actually invited him to join. Meaning, I don't want to be anything I can imagine or conceptualize is not where I want to be because it is beyond that. It's beyond anything I can imagine. My, my imagination is programmed every, by my stuff. It is beyond that. So, and the name is all that. So, repeat the name, be aware of what you're doing, be aware of the sound of the name, and then be aware of when you're not paying attention, and then come back. And it's more of a, in Buddhist meditation, or really all meditation, there's two aspects. There's the concentration aspect and the, uh, how to say it, When you're doing concentration practice, you try to remain concentrated on one object, the object of concentration. Mindfulness practice many times uh, means being aware of whatever arises, not just one particular thing. There's differences. And then there's practices that are like half this and half that. But Mantra practice is something, it's more of a concentration practice than a vipassana. But the name itself has tremendous, just like the seed of an oak tree, it can be very small. The whole tree is in that seed. God is in the name. Everything you want, the whole universe is in that name. So that's what we want to just, in this practice, we pay attention to that. And in this practice, we can use visualizations, we can think about Maharaji, we can think about Ramdas, we can think about anything that opens our hearts. But even while we're doing that, we must eventually stay with the sound of the name, come back to that again and again. And, and like when you chant, you know, I feel like, you bring Maharaji, for me anyway, into presence, like really viscerally. And like, is there something you do? Is it just like over time, like somehow it, it becomes that? I don't know. I love answering your questions. I just sing. I don't know what happens. It's happening to you, not to me. I'm just moping around, chanting. You're feeling him. What the, what the fuck is that about? Why don't I get any of that? That's just a thought, so I'll keep singing and let it go. <clears throat> Hi. Yes. I wondered if you could say something about language. It sounds like a lot of chanting um, is in Sanskrit. And have you had much experience chanting in other languages? And do you find that there's a significance regarding language? You know, the sun is up in the sky, except today. And all around the world, people will look up in the sky and they'll say, ah, and they'll say, sun in their own language. Same sun. Pretty much all I can say about that. My hit came from India. I once had this dream that I was reincarnating, coming back to Earth again, you know? And I was heading right back home to India. Yeah, this is great. And at the last minute, I took a left turn and wound up in New York. So, but India is, you know, it was home for me. It's such, I felt completely at home there and like, like I had never been at home before. So that's, my, that's why this is this. If it was another country of another thing, it would be something else. There's a lot to say about Sanskrit and 
revealed languages, supposedly, but I don't know anything about it. I just sing. I was wondering what your thoughts were on non-mindful. Wait, wait, where are you, where are you? Here. Oh, hi. Hi. I was wondering what your thoughts were on non-mindful <clears throat> mantra repetition. So I remember Ram Das. Thoughts on what? Non-mindful mantra how repetition. Can, how, can you, how can you be saying something and not aware you're saying? Well, so Ram Das had this story about when he came back from India and he was like washing the dishes or talking to his father and repeating mantra. I never saw him wash a dish in his whole life. <laughs> but anyway, go ahead. And I think about that sometimes as like such a great way to multitask and also such a great way to maybe not focus on anything completely. And I was wondering if you had experience with that kind of dual tasking with mantra and what your thoughts were on it. Yeah, I mean, once again, it's something that has to be developed. If you want to learn how to play an instrument, you have to practice. You have to learn how to do it, right? So just, just starting to say Ram, Ram, Ram doesn't mean you're going to be present with it all the time. A lot of times, it'll come back to you during the day. You know, and just in a moment, you'll hear yourself. Like, a lot of times, some of the chant, quite a few of the chants that I do, showed up like while I was driving or at night when I was sleeping. They just, I just noticed them. Oh, did I ever hear that before? I don't think so, you know. So you, you just give yourself to it as much as you can. You notice when you're not paying attention, when you're in your practice session, that's when you really notice that you're not paying attention when you're not. The rest of the day, you know, you, you kind of just do the best you can. But they say that the mantra is always going on inside of you. That's what they say. I don't know. That's what they say. In other words, I, I don't want to get too esoteric because I don't really know what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> However, they say that there's the name and your true nature are not different. So your true nature is always invoking, is always singing, is always expressing itself in us, always. We're always here, but we're not paying attention most of the time. So the name, repetition of the name is, is a way of moving into that awareness. So a lot of times it'll come back to you during the day without you even thinking about it first, right? So that's good. And then you become, then you're mindful. Yeah, well, let's not use that word. Then you're aware of it when you hear it. Then you forget it. And, that's what, and then it'll come back. And when you notice it, if you're aware enough, you can lock in a little bit, no matter what you're doing. It's all good. It just keeps, it's a process. So, is that anything like what you were asking? You can't do, you can, you think, you know, a, we think we could do two things at once or be aware of two things, but actually it's not true. The mind arises and dies a million times in the blink of an eye. It's called a mind moment. This is part of Buddhist psychology. And it's so fast that you think you're actually aware of two things at the same time, but not. You're actually going... So... The answer is yes and no. You might experience it that way, that's okay. But the reality is, you're not really aware of two things at the same time. But since you think you are, that's okay. It's okay. That's because the name will pull you eventually. As it'll draw you in more and more as time goes on. And then it'll be always... The ocean is the ocean. And the waves are on the surface, but they're connected to everything in the ocean all the time. So those moments when we're like kind of out of it, that's like being caught in the waves. We're still connected to the whole ocean, even when we think we're not. We're not aware, but we are. A wave is made of nothing but ocean. 
Right. Even when it thinks it's a wave, it's still part of the ocean. It's still ocean. So when you're aware, you're aware of that. When you're not, you're not aware of it, it doesn't mean it's not true. So you're always here, whether you remember or not. And the name will, will remind you as it comes back and goes away, it comes back and comes away. So it's perfectly fine. Um, what you want to avoid is too much thinking about it. You know, is this okay? I don't think this is okay. I should be doing this. I shouldn't do that. Maybe I should do that. Okay, I'll do that. No, I can't do that. I'll do this. And, you know. that's, that's ridiculous. You know, just... Yeah, I'm channeling you right now. I know. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's, you know, when you notice it, let it go. It'll come back. That's all. Yeah. See, that's... That's, yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, right. But we all, that's, where, that's who we are. That's where, you know, that's who we are most of the time. Hello. Hello. So happy to be here. Good. Hey, so I've been thinking as, I mean, I Sorry think we... Sorry to hear that. <laughs> well, I have been. Okay. And I'm thinking about people in my life that I love, um, my parents or friends or... We can all think of a, someone that we love that we would love to expose t um, these teachings and philosophies to, or we have tried to, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, listen to this video by Ram Dass or mm -hmm. read this book, and sometimes, um, you know, we never want to force it upon them, but we just are so excited to share it with them, and sometimes they may not be ready or don't feel interested, or, but I, I want, you know, I want them to to feel what I feel, and I'd love to know the best way I, to, to share. So I had a friend uh, who was actually with us, with Ramdas in the old days in, in, uh, in New Hampshire when we did those summers together. His name was Fred, and he was a, a, basically a Zen Buddhist meditator. We used to sit together uh, at the uh, Zen Center in San Francisco. <clears throat> he was amazing. Uh, and he said, and he was from Shaker Heights, Cleveland, a little Jewish kid from Shaker Heights, Cleveland. He said, when I go home, when I'm a Buddhist, my mother is just like so disturbed. But when I'm Buddha, she loves me. So, you know, you have nothing to prove. Everybody's okay, you know. And, you know, and you, really the, um, the need to try to make to try to give this to other people is really uh, self-doubt. You know, you, you want them to see you in a certain way and approve of you, and so you want them to get it. It's not really compassion for them. It's more like, hey, hey, see me? Ain't that cool? So, you know, notice all that, and when you're loved, everybody will feel good. When you're, when you're not, you know, then you're in, you know you're home with your family. <laughs> Ain't it the truth? Hi. Next, next victim, where are Over you? Over here. Hi. Um, Wednesday night you mentioned the connection between Durga and Hanuman, and I hadn't heard that before, and I was curious <clears throat> if you would, it hit me in a really strong way, and mm. um, I'm curious if you'd be willing to say more about it. I'm not sure if I can. I don't think I know anything more about it. I remember seeing this poster in India of Kali, and she had her sword ready to cut off the head of this demon, and Hanuman was helping her with the sword, you know. He had, the, he had his hands on the sword, too. So, <clears throat> uh, you know, can I say something? I haven't said anything yet, but I want to say something. You know, we talk about Hanuman, Durga, Shiva, Kali. We talk about these beings like we know what the fuck we're talking about. We don't. We don't know who they are. We don't know what they are, you know. We know Frank and Tom and Joan and all these people, but Kali, Durga, you know, we don't know. So, all those stories about the deities and how they do what they do, You know, I don't know. 
I just know that I want more love. That's all I know. Who they are, what they are, where they are, that's their problem. I have no idea what's going on. I just want to get through the day with more love. I want to be with Maharaji more of the time. And that's what I want. That's, that's all I know. I once went to some friends of mine had a yoga studio and they invited me to sing to their teacher trainees. So I'm sitting there and they're giving their introductory spiel to these poor people who are going to be destroyed by their training soon. And they were saying things like, if you don't know, they had the pictures of all the, the deities, the gods and the goddesses on the wall. And they were saying, if you don't know these deep gods and goddesses, you'll never be a yoga teacher. I like pulled my blanket over my head, you know, I just wanted to get out of there so fast. Boy, the, the things we do, and we think we're helping people, you know. Christ. So, let's just try to be good people, you know. That's what practice gives us, the strength to overcome the way we hurt ourselves and hurt other people, the way we create suffering for ourselves and other people. We want to become good human beings. And that's, that's the curriculum at this point for all of us. And whatever that means to each one of us, whatever we have to do to, to, to get that to that place is, is what we have to do. And it's different for everybody. That's it. Oh, okay. Where's Hardy? Hardy. Hi. Where are you? I'm here. Okay, hi. <laughs> um, first, I wanted to say how much I appreciate your chanting. Um, it's opened my heart and brought me to tears many times. So thank you. Great. Thank um, you. I have so many questions, and I wish I have a whole day with you, but I guess I have to... That can be arranged. Pick one. Okay, I, I love that. Speak to Nina. Okay. <laughs> um, so, I'm, I'm relatively new on this path of devotion, and I'm very judgmental and I'm doubtful. I'm also very mopey. Um, oh, excellent. We will awesome. spend a day together. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sounds um, like we've already been spending our lives together. That's why I want a whole day with you. Oh, um, How but, much moping the whole earth would turn around, <laughs> kind of flip over on its side. That'd be lovely. Yeah. Um, but, so, all my life I wanted to meet someone like Maharaji that is so powerful that just like undeniably open your heart and like remove all the blockers, like I can be enlightened, yeah. right? Um, Me too, by the way. Exactly, yeah. right? <laughs> but you had the chance, actually, which I didn't, so I I'm really jealous. I guess I blew it then, because I'm not open all the time, so I guess he, he didn't do good with me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But... <laughs> I like the way you did that, yeah. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. But reading about the stories and hearing about it is basically this, the next best thing and, you know, meeting with you and talking with you, right? Yeah. Um, sort of like a transmission. And I, can, I know the answer to my question, but I just wanted to hear it from you. Okay, um, you answer it first and I'll either agree or disagree. <laughs> but uh, uh, let, let me say the question first. Oh, okay. So the question is, um, are those uh, magical miracles stories of Maharaji, are they real? Please swear your life on it. Uh, <laughs> okay, if they're not real, I am going to disappear right now. You ready? I guess they're real. Lovely, thank you. I, I know the answer. I yeah, mean, no, I just wanted to actually, hear it. Every single word is true. Just so you know. And beyond. We only hear the things that we could possibly understand. The truth is even beyond anything we could imagine. More, much more beautiful, more love, more sublime, more real than anything we could imagine. So. Thank you so much. That, that gives me so much more to confidence on, the, on this path. Okay. Um, the other thing is uh, um, when that person <laughs> asked you about the connection to Guru, 
and to Maharaji, and you said, you, you know, you need to discover your own. Um, that's, I believe that, and I, and I um, you know, I take your advice, but then... If you, I, be if you believe there's no but, but we'll just but, continue. Yeah. <laughs> but the, you know, the person in me um, still wanted to hear about, and I assume you bathe in his unconditional love, you know, that chance that I envy. Um, how was that like, and how it changed you? Um, <clears throat> being with him half the time was absolutely the greatest moments of my life. The other half the time were the worst, worst possible imaginable moments of my life. Right there, sitting in front of him at the same time. Because all the love in the universe is there. He led us into the room where love is. Our own minds, our own heads dragged us out again and again and again. And then he would drag us back in again and again and again. And then our minds, our stuff would drag us out again and again. That's how he taught. He didn't teach with words. He taught by, you know, keep, he kept bringing us back into that room where love is, where love lives. And we kept pulling ourselves out. And he kept bringing us back. So that's, that was what it was like. And the horror of sitting one foot away from him or holding his feet and being completely disconnected and closed down and, you know, depressed and angry and screwed up while you're holding his foot, you know? And then you're going to, then you finally said, oh, fuck it, I'm going to let go of this foot. And you're just about to let go, and he goes, touch my feet. Ah. <laughs> he said, well, if you don't care. See, it was beginning of training us not to care about our thoughts, not to even care how we saw ourselves, not to believe that. He showed us over and over again that he didn't care, and he knew everything. Everything. Oh, God. Everything, really. Oh, yeah. Everything. And all he did was love. And he loved us as we are, not as we would imagine we could be or wanted to be, which is some crazy, weird version of nothing. He loved us as we are right now. And all we have to do is fall into it, but we can't. We're too glued to our stuff. But that's okay. That's what practice is for. That's, isn't that great? We have these practices to do. Everybody, all the presenters here are sharing their, their roads into the heart, into reality. So, you know, sometimes you feel like a nut. Sometimes you don't. You pick what you like. Hardy, with Hardy. Hardy, would you retire? Give him the mic. Give him the mic. Where's the mic? There's somebody over there or somebody somewhere. Oh, they want us to stop. That's what it is, huh? Anybody know how to make an iWatch I, I show the time when you want it? Please let me know. Anyway, we'll take a couple of short questions. Go ahead. And the, I think the back, the people in the back are feeling neglected. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank those, you so much. Yeah, those um, are cheap seats back there, you know. They are. Yeah. <laughs> I'm willing to pay for them, though. The bleachers. Go ahead. I just wanted to thank you for your vulnerability. Like, one day I was walking in um, New York, and I happened upon this film that happened to be about you. Ah. And um, that was a moment. Baby Does Dallas, was it? Yeah, it was. Oh, okay. I didn't want to tell everybody. 
Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, quick, before anybody gets on to it. <laughs> but it was a, you're needing to chant that you just spoke of, that it woke up something in me. And, um, and then I what, heard you sing Madhugra and Joshua Tree. And the moment that you open your mouth and sing, I burst into tears because it was like I found the place of love in me. And I just want to thank you for your path, for your suffering that brought you to chant. Because the uh, thing before this was about the grace of suffering. And I thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sounds like a PTA meeting. <laughs> anyway, it's okay. Next victim, last victim for today. Okay, up here, up here. Somebody up here had a hand. Oh yeah, she fell asleep, quick, wake her up. So, you said my favorite quote, sometimes you feel like a nut, and that's something that you've said to me several times when I pester you about what's my mantra, should I chant Hare Krishna, should I chant Sita Ram? And in Chance of a Lifetime, you share about the two sadhus that are singing Sita, they're told to sing Sita Ram. Yeah. And then they switch it up and do jazz and are like, Ram, yeah. Lakshman, Janaki. And you said the secret is awareness. And I wonder, is it, so is it the name or is it just the name holding us, like as awareness? So is it, should we just be saying, I am loving awareness? And that's the way my mind works. I go back and forth between Hare Krishna to I am loving awareness because I am loving awareness brings me right there. It takes me out and then it's just the love. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with like, I had a mantra, um, not good humanhood, not bad humanhood, Christhood. And so it's like no people to think about, not even Nikki to think about, just that love. Is it just the love? Um, Ram Das and I, we just, we, I said to him once, he started, you know, I am loving awareness. I am. Finally, I said, Ramdas, it's just loving awareness. And he went, loving awareness, loving awareness. And he, if you see, that's what he was doing. You know, I've, uh, I am loving awareness is conceptual. You're thinking about it. You're thinking it. It doesn't make you it. You're trying to recognize it. So if it takes you, if that practice takes you into it, into the feeling of it, then there's no I am anymore, there's just loving awareness. But if you keep saying loving awareness, then you kind of come out of it, you know. So, um, But it's very powerful. It's just that for a lot of people, they get stuck on the thinking about it part, and they don't allow themselves to go into it. To, it doesn't. They don't surrender into what what the mind is saying, the words. With the with the Sanskrit mantras, um, you don't know what they mean, so you can't get stuck thinking about them. It's a sound. And many experiences come, they come from the inside, the experiences. It's not two different things, it's just two slightly different approaches. Um, Maharaji was always, the name was always gone. Like I said before, he said, all I know is Rahma. So, and Ramdas translates that into English for us, which is, is, I am loving awareness. That's what Rama is. So anything, you know, that whatever's working for you, uh, you don't want to get to, I mean, you want to kind of give yourself to one practice for a little while. You don't want to do like three different things in the same two minute session, you know, because you want to give yourself a chance to relax into it or to be with it. But it's up to each individual, to, you know, to create your own menu, you know, it's like your own thing. That's the, the great thing, you know, you, nobody needs to tell you what to do. You can, 
You can adopt different techniques as you wish. Uh, and if you're sincere, any technique will work if you're sincere, theoretically. But it's hard for us to really give ourselves to, to the practices. So, for instance, when Maharaji, back in those days, when he said, I keep chanting, chanting, it was like nails on a blackboard. It was brutal. The boredom, you know, the despair, everything came up and you just, but you had to keep chanting. So the clouds parted, you know, but if you don't stay with it, they don't part. You give, eventually they will, of course, they have to, they do. That's the nature of clouds. They come and they go. So, but you need a little patience. And our expectations that, you know, we're going to sit down and, you know, by in 13 minutes I will have gone beyond the farthest, you know, it's too much Star Wars, you know, too much Harry Potter and too much foundation stuff, you know, the fantasies. You got to deal with reality, which is how you go through the day and how you treat everybody that comes into your awareness. That's the most important thing. If we could treat other beings the way we want to be treated, are you kidding? The whole world would be a different place immediately. It's not easy. We have to find the strength to do that and to overcome our selfishness and our greed and our jealousy and our anger and our sense of righteousness, all that stuff in order to treat other people the way we want to be treated. That's the whole deal. That's what Maharaji did. He literally saw everyone as his own true self, not as something separate. And so, he literally sees everyone as his own true self. I slip into the past sometimes, you know, but that's ridiculous with him. Okay, so that's it, right? Time to go. Thank you for coming. <laughs>